Um, but just really curious. So hurry up and make that announcement, Adaloop. Uh, 741, let's head into the KUM News Zoom room where we have the Speaker of the Guam Legislature, the 36th Guam Legislature, uh, Speaker uh, Therese Terlahi. Good morning, Speaker. Good morning. Good morning, KUAM. Good morning, Chris, Brina, Jason, everyone, and all, all the listeners. Good morning. Um, I, uh, and thanks for coming on. First of all, I don't know if you had any comment as the uh, land share on any of the things that uh, we had discussed with uh, CLTC Administrator Jack Hattig. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, they are in a predicament. They have a new chair. And uh, so I know that they're working very hard to, to really uh, get some of these programs moving that had not been moving for a while. So um, I wanted to give them some credit for that. I think, uh, you know, they raise a lot of questions for people, but I think it's not as complex as it might sound. That, uh, yeah, if they take a look at the affidavit, that they will they will be assured that almost everyone who's qualified before is qualified now mm -hmm. and um, in fact more people might be qualified so so that was really the intent of the settlement uh, just... um, and but but they have other issues that they are facing of course you know commercial leases and and um, dumping as he described uh, so you know we've had some hearings on those types of things and, and hoping that we're going we have a way to resolve them moving forward. Well, that's good. But, good to hear because you know when he when he mentioned the eight thousand or so that you know have been waiting and then might have to wait a little bit longer because of uh, these new cri new criteria. Um, it's it's good to hear that it, it might not be as um, devastating as it sounds. But what about this? Right. We've always tried to ensure that the priority, you know, uh, is residential leases. I think that's the greatest need. That's what they need to address first and. Uh, Sometimes I feel like the commission has, you know, become distracted with uh, other things when, yeah, I want, I, you know, by my way, they would focus on residential leases and they would push those out as fast as possible. People have been waiting so long that mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it hasn't served the purpose it was supposed to serve. And that was to, you know, help them to find, have a place to live get their families out of poverty, especially those who, who really are on the, the border and uh, just to to take care of them. And so I'm hoping that they will move on those residential leases as quickly as possible. What that should be the goal. Did you hear what uh, uh, Mr. Hattick said about uh, the possibility that the Tomorrow Land Trust Commission could be insolv insolvent by 2024? Um, and that's one of the uh, main reasons that uh, he you know he's hoping to get um, some sort of revenue uh, from uh, the EPAL from EPAL point. Well, they have um, several pieces of property that they've listed uh, as available for commercial lease. And they're supposed to make this determination that the property is available for commercial lease only after they say that it is not needed for residential or agricultural mm -hmm. leases as, as is the goal of this commission. And uh, when they lease commercial properties yes they should be getting the best value and if they got the best value then then i i would think that uh you know they'd be able to take care of um other needs i don't this oka the ipa point property i think is a a little bit uh it's complicated right now because of uh, other concerns and sabrina you always point out the original owners when they transferred this property to the government of guam was for a very particular purpose and I think we have to we have to address that. And that was for a hospital, right? They wanted a hospital to be built on the cliff, just like the Navy's hospital was being built up there on the cliff at the time. And uh, it's a very important uh, history of ours. And I think we need to honor and respect that. Right. But um, yes, commercial lease, and they're, they're insolvent, you know, you're gonna have to address that in several ways. One is, you know, to address uh, spending. Second, yeah, address, um, you know what their priorities have been collections on those properties i know you asked about that collection on the existing commercial leases have they got the best value for for the property that they are leasing out and and of course you know the government well, the government of guam graded the chamorro land trust uh, fund that was supposed to be used for surveying infrastructure different things and they've never been reimbursed and so that's another issue you know it's kind of like we're gonna make 
these guys take residential property or potential residential property, lease it out for commercial to raise money when, and then the money gets raided on the other side by the government of Guam. And that should never happen. You know, I've, I've tried to follow up with this commission over and over, the AGs, whether they're going to, you know, anything can be done. And, um, but that happened several years ago. And but those are the types of things where, you know, we're just going around in circles at that point and we have to stop. So right now, uh, the budget is pretty much based on their revenue. And uh, that's why he says they will be insolvent. But there's nothing to prevent the legislature from addressing their budget better, you know, um, or, or yeah, getting better value on, on the existing commercial leases or other potential commercial leases. Mm -hmm. what, what do you make of this? Uh, what do you make of this proposal for the... Uh, uh, I don't even know. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I mean, the part that got got me was that raised my eyebrows was um, there was something in this phased uh, proposal where they want to grow hemp at Epal Point, but given GVB's attitude about the cannabis, I mean, I don't even know if they know the difference between cannabis and hemp. But do you see that being? I mean, is GVB going to be kicking and screaming? Uh, you know, after they see this on the link. Well, if they're talking about use of EPAP point, I think it, it's just a one proposal that they've received. And I, I think it's an incumbent on the commission to put that property out for, um, you know, different bits that they, there's no way they're going to be able to settle on this one proposal, I think, without uh, investigating further what, what other uses of the property could be made and what is the best use of this property. What's yeah, at this time. So, um, as to GVB and what they do there, I, you know, uh, I'll leave that to GVB. But um, you know, the, their 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 goal to address housing, I think, is of course that's the goal of the commission as well. So, so those two are compatible. I just don't uh, know if that's the best use of this particular property. Of course, you know, this particular property is really the gem of uh, Guam. It's. Uh, and if it's going to be used for any other purpose than a hospital, then I think that needs to be fully vetted. Um, well, we can move on to something okay. else. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah. Uh, the last time we had you on, uh, you were mentioning um, that uh, you are now or have been uh, invited to these weekly, I want to say, meetings with the governor um, to get the updates on COVID response. Is that correct? Do, do, do you yes. have any, when, when was the last time you guys met and what updates can you um, um, share publicly? I, uh, it's the beginning of the week normally. I think uh, this week's was not on Monday, but on Tuesday. And uh, it's just me and the mayor and the governor and the lieutenant governor. Um, and and uh, I actually enjoy, it's just a Zoom meeting and they're they're quick. And uh, she gives an update on, on COVID and and she allows us to ask questions. And uh, I actually enjoy hearing the mayor's uh, um, questions as well, because it, it, it immediately lets me know what, what is on the top of the mayor's priority list and all the mayors. And he, he does a great job of representing all the mayors across the island and uh, talking about their, their top priorities. And so, of course, the, um, the uh, homebound uh, rollout of vaccines for the homebound was was top of his list, and and, uh, and so we're we're hearing about the vaccination plan primarily now, right? And uh, whether we're reaching our goals, uh, uh, how we're going to reach those goals by July. Uh, I'm I'm very much looking for the details. That's that's my priority. I want to see the details of how we're going to get to this percentage by July. If if that's if that's the goal, how do we actually get there? We've seen these um, vaccination places now kind of waiting for people to show up. They're not showing up like we hoped they would. And I think uh, that's our next job. It's to how are we going to get people to be vaccinated, to believe that, you know, the 75 and older, they they were in, they mm -hmm. were motivated and, and they stood through four hour lines and all kinds of things, hardship to get, get vaccinated. But the 60 year olds have not. So apparently, 75 and older are vaccinated at a rate of, of like 80 percent right. but the seven the 60 year olds are only at about 17 percent the last time i i, I was yep. told so that's and why we should, we should just skip to the next group the 60 year olds don't want to get the vaccine let's move on to the 40s perhaps 
the problem is, uh, yeah, well, they need to concentrate on the 60s and the 55 year olds and older because those are what the numbers show the highest death rates are. And so if you don't want to die, this is, you know, I mean, that sounds uh, maybe, um, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, insensitive, but no, it's really, those are the highest risk. And we have to really stress that. I just don't think they understand that yet, you know, that uh, this is the highest risk categories. It's not just the 75 years old, it's the 60 and older, it's the 55 and older, and and they have to get serious about, yeah, taking care of themselves. and. And uh, you know who they're going to come in contact with as well. And so, yeah. But I agree with you, Chris. The the sooner we can get it to the younger uh, ones, that's good because they're the transmitters, right? And we need to uh, stop this virus. And so, for me, I think everyone needs to buy into this if they want to buy into opening all the businesses, right? Opening every type of um, activity. This is the only way. It's either yeah, you wipe COVID out of the world, which we can't do, but we can, we can yeah, immunize ourselves here, you know, and protect ourselves here so that we can open up to the world, take care of ourselves. No more deaths is really what I'm hoping that they will tie this to. And businesses should, should make this their priority as well, that if they want openings, they want, you know, full business, then let's get full vaccination, get your employees, get your families, get your, you know, families, friends, everything, and uh, get everyone um, to to protect themselves so that we can all function the way we the way we like to, you know, in big groups and uh, with um, lots of hugging. During your uh, discussion with uh, the, the, the meeting, the virtual meeting, did the governor indicate that she plans on extending the public health uh, emergency, which is set to expire uh, this Friday? No, actually, that didn't come up. I, I, I guess I'm just assuming that it, that's going to happen again, mm -hmm. although we do have a bill that we've set for a hearing. Uh, uh, it's a Chris Duenas bill that uh, would change the determination, uh, you know, who determines whether an emergency gets extended, a public health emergency gets extended, whether it's the governor or the legislature. So that bill's been set for a hearing at, uh, early February, maybe right. February 8th. Uh I wanted to ask uh, just real quick because uh, I know there's a little back and forth uh, last uh, term with this nurses uh, licensure uh, bill that I know the last term it was referred to your committee, but this term it's been referred to Senator St. Augustine's. Uh, what is it? Were they getting on government operation? I just maybe you could explain why that change uh, from rules chair uh, vice speaker uh, Tina Mooney Barnes. Well, the, the bill is a little bit different and uh, she had included, the sponsor included a uh, provision, an appropriation of $6,000 from the uh, health professional licensing office budget to the nurse compact fees. And I think because of that $6,000 appropriation, I'm guessing that's why they referred it to the appropriations committee. I've asked him uh, to re-refer the bill. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that will happen. Uh, I think it, it's something that should be fully vetted by the health committee as well. And um, uh, because the, it's, you know, those are the implications that I think are, are primary in the bill. Uh, We've also introduced a bill recently uh, that would uh, fund um, nurse, differential pay at the Guam Memorial Hospital. And we've, uh, and so we are hoping to bring the nurse differential pay or the nurse uh, uh, wages at the hospital up to a level that would make them competitive, uh, you know, with uh, the national average so that we would not lo lose nurses uh, up to, you know, off island um, companies or, or work and that they would want to stay on Guam. Now, I know the conditions at the hospital, they're, they're difficult conditions to work in sometimes. However, yeah, these nurses are very dedicated. So we want to keep them there. We want to attract more. We want to give them enough worse uh, nurses up there so that uh, all of them, you know, have an easier job at it and, and, and are not struggling as much to, to take care of all of us. Mm -hmm. And so what, we're, what this might do, so they've estimated to us that um, uh, they would need about eight hundred thousand dollars more to bring the the wages up to like a, a just the median. I think the average, 
And uh, so we found about a million dollars to to put over there to supplement uh, wages for nurses. That's what we're trying to do to uh, shore up GMH. So no matter what hits us next, we are we are ready and we will retain these nurses. We will not lose them. And we not have to pay those high fees off island. Hopefully, we can reduce that a little bit. You know, for the the off island traveling nurses, and that we will be able to grow our own nurses and keep them there at GMH. Uh, speaker, I wanted to, uh, uh, relative to the health committee, there was just this, like, um, kind of came out of left field, emergency declaration for uh, CPS, which is now under the, um, it's almost like a GovGlom receivership, but they're under DYA now, right? Uh, I don't know how this happened, and we were talking earlier about how did this get by um, the governor and the senators, and um, what about the conditions at CPS prompted this emergency declaration? And what are we going to do now? Well, um, I think uh, we sh we um, well, I'm glad that it's not getting by, that it's getting stopped right now, that it's getting addressed, and that uh, that's my hope is that this is a. Uh, this is what you want. This is what you want. When you see a problem that people are going to step in and we're going to try to fix it. And so the problem just, you know, we, we, you know, um, just found that it couldn't be fixed in any other way at this point, except to just, yeah, uh, get more help. So that's what they've done. And I, I want to thank the Lieutenant Governor for leading that and the Governor to bringing more help over to CPS, which they've always needed. And uh, so making it a priority and and I'm hoping that's going to help take care of the cases. And that's really the bottom line is that let's just take care of all the cases that are pending. Let's see where we need to do for these children. And if they're putting more attention to it, so that's going to expedite it, then then that's that's perfect. That's what we want. But but were you aware? Were you given any sort of um, inclination by public health that this was such a severe problem? Uh, you know, when we spoke to Melanie, um, she said, yeah, there is a backlog. Um, she didn't know at the time because it was just her first day on Monday uh, taking over uh, CPS, but just from n numbers that she did have on hand uh, for FY20, she said there were 1,000 referrals. Whether or not they yes, been vetted, she was But I think sure. that that's, that's, that's what happens at CPS. That's not abnormal that they're going to get that many referrals. The, the issue is, yeah, are they able to address them? And I think COVID really, you know, of course interfered a little bit, but uh, but they've always been uh, really, um, really, you know, struggling. It, these are people, they go out one by one. I mean, you know, case by case to handle them. And so they've always had a backlog, I think, but mm -hmm. they, yeah, but they've just, tried their best they worked at it worked at it and uh but yeah it's just become uh, serious now that the cases have lingered too long and, and so uh hopefully they're going to be addressed i think you know i don't know if you remember but you know we've always had this other issue with the um that comes up because of uh children that we see on the streets right so we see that they don't have shelter uh and we refer them to cps or they get referred to cps and then you know, CPS is in a bind of, um, yeah, uh, they, we're trying to bring all the services together to take care of these families, and it just doesn't happen fast enough. So sometimes the situations are, are getting worse. And I think we're seeing this, um, well, we've been seeing this over the years, but they've been, you know, trying their hardest to address it. So, no, I just think, yes, bring more people in and try to keep them there if we can i think what but i've i've been assured by the director that they are they they're filling the vacancies at um cps for social workers so they're filling those those they're going to be filled they're going to get more people they've had several retirees and i know this because i've given them resolutions of retirees that have been there over 30 years that have retired several of them in the last year and um so you know it's again i hate to say this but during this covid we've seen a culmination of things happen in different agencies and cps is one of the one of these that uh, but um i also um yeah i think uh, what they're trying to do now is just it's just focused i think if you look around the government you'll see this is mm -hmm. what happened it's like once something gets focused on it can be fixed 
it's just a matter of yeah when they're going to focus on it and we've tried to do this in the past with the cps we put additional money there in the last couple budgets uh particularly because we've seen this and and especially with the homeless issues that uh yeah we need to we need more people to get out there and address those mm -hmm. those situations it's, to address all the referrals. And uh, so we, we've, we've tried, and I think they, that this is a good effort to bring in to bring in the people immediately, while instead of waiting for the positions to be filled, waiting for you know anything else to kick in, that, that they just come in and take care of the cases that are lingering. Because uh, you know it's moved over to DYA, do you still have oversight over CP, CPS? Uh, yes. Okay. I yes. I don't think it's moved over to DYA. Oh. DYA personnel are um, helping CPS. I don't think we can move BOSA, right? I mean, mm -hmm. but uh, but anyways, whatever the arrangement is, they are literally helping to address the case backlog at CPS, yeah. which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's great. But, but I, mean, you know, I, I had uh, raised with the lieutenant governor that I had heard that uh, CPS was going to be tapped on to help with uh, contact tracing. And of course, you know, I've been going back and forth with the Department of Public Health on this. It's like, you need staff to take care of contact tracing that is not dedicated to doing anything else. So I haven't received confirmation whether that was the case at, or, or not, but regardless, by now, I hope that's moot and that uh, everybody's uh, full on board with what they're supposed to be doing. I hope so, because uh, when we talk about a thousand referrals, I mean, in my mind, I see a thousand children who CPS is supposed to go into these homes and save these kids. And I don't want to get too far away from that's the reality of it. I mean, we can talk about backlog and it's the way it always is. But at the end of the day, I think that we just have to remember that these are children's lives at stake and that this agency of our government was tasked with the responsibility to defend and protect these kids. And it just wasn't happening, right? Well, uh, unfortunately, they might not have been able to get to all the kids, yes. And I agree with you, Chris, That's uh, it, it has to be addressed. So I'm just glad that they are addressing it because we've been talking about this for a while. And so that they finally put people there, manpower, it's good. And as you, you know, you know, when, um, I don't know. I'm not going to try to explain for anybody else what they were thinking, but uh, I can only talk for myself and that we've tried to bring this problem to light. We've, you know, that uh, we need faster action, especially, you know, with, with the ones that we see in front of us. And uh, we knew that the action was not ha happening fast enough. But, mm -hmm. but you know, we did, we did make some progress, but I don't know. For example, like the foster home. Right? So we expanded the capacity for the foster home up at Barragata, yet it's not been opened and it was supposed to be opened a year ago. And that, those types of things, you know, um, it's like hitting your head on the wall. It's, it's just very frustrating. I heard someone say on your show the other day, you're waiting for one part or something for the water. Mm. Yeah, I can't understand that. Uh, those are the types of things that, uh, you know, I don't know, but, but hopefully solved. And that's uh, every day I have to get up and try to force ourselves to go forward, you know, because going backwards, we're just going to um, get really frustrated and, and really down and we just have to move forward. But Chris, you're right. I mean, it's serious. This is serious. Yeah. This is serious. It's serious all across the board that, uh, you know, if we're not able to take care of the children, I think we might be looking at even more issues that we're not even aware of yet that are stemming from this pandemic from the closure of the schools right and and once the, the children start going back to school that we those might come to light again because there's someone else with other eyes you know looking at that and so i'm just hoping that these resources can remain with with the cps so that we can continue to to address all the cases and really it's that it's a matter of prioritizing so uh even you know public health they've got to prioritize who they put there you know, what resources they are dedicating. And we need social workers. We still need social workers in the government of Guam. So I'm just gonna put that plug in as well because they, they are struggling to fill um, psychiatrist positions, social worker positions that, and this is all the service providers that get out there and really do these hands-on work. And I wanna give a really big, um, you know, thumbs up to the, uh, 
the Homeless Coalition because they have really been very active. They've they've got an excellent coalition that that has done that hands-on work. They've made many referrals over the years, and uh, they've they they see these families. They follow up with them, and so they're able to do that. Uh, Sabrina, me okay. You know there was a there was an issue that uh, w that came to my attention, and I also uh, the individual that gave me the tip had actually gone to Adeloupe about it about yeah. some some issues regarding uh, some of the nurses over at uh, the quarantine. I mean, yeah, quarantine facility. Um, pretty serious allegations about some uh, b being unresponsive, not being there. You know, they have a suite over at the Ducet. Um, but instead of uh, responding to calls, some of them were either drinking or on the beach or out shopping. Um, and some of them were, you know, writing down exorbitant amount of hours that they weren't actually working. Have you heard anything about um, this? Um, I've heard about that, Sabrina, but unfortunately, I don't have an update for you on it. I. Uh, I don't have an update on that, but I, I I did discuss that with the director as well, and uh, I just don't have an update. Right. And so we were wondering, uh, because I think Janella had said it was under review, mm -hmm. but we didn't know if that was spin talk for under investigation. So do you know if it, is it under review or is it under investigation? I, I don't know. I don't I don't even know what would be the legal def, uh, you know distinction between those two at this point, but uh, I hope, of course, that they just do what they need to do because uh, we've got many other issues to address. We don't need these, I call them these huge distractions of, of you know, uh, alternate behavior. Yeah, we just mm -hmm. need everyone to do what they're supposed to be doing and get this job done because we need, there are many other jobs waiting for us. For example, yeah, getting the rest of the community vaccinated and, and now dealing with, uh, I don't know, I just saw this news from the Philippines about that the you know they're dealing with the other strain of the virus there and i know that you know we've been receiving flights from the philippines and i i think this should be a very big concern for us i think alternate behavior that's going to be our catchphrase for the show this morning alternate behavior. <laughs> Hey, well, you, know, you know, there were pictures and videos, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. or a video yes. um, that, that I saw. And it's always, you know, of course, I, people legitimately should be upset if yeah. they, if people um, in the government are getting paid and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So um, I don't blame anyone for being upset. And I'm glad that they're bringing it to, a, you know, uh, our attention. And uh, I'm hoping that those in charge make, you know, they swiftly act on these things. We. We just cannot afford this right now. We cannot afford to be distracted by, yeah, um, just employees not doing what they're supposed to be doing. We need everyone to be full on board, working full, full, full time, making up for lost time. Uh, I think I've said that before, but it's it's so important. I mean, that's the number one complaint I get. People aren't answering their phones at at us. You know, I hate to say, but CLTC is the biggest uh, complaint I get about not answering their phones. And so I've talked about that. You know, the director, and we've got to address those issues. And so they talk about phone problems, but it's been going on for a long time. And and so, Speaker, can you can you I hold, think can you hold on for just a second? Can you hold on for just a second? Um, we've got to cut out of our okay. TV yeah, here. 808 uh, to our viewers on KUAM TV. Jump over to our Facebook live feed or on KUAM FM. I got any Guam the breeze to continue our interview with the uh, speaker Teresa Lai of the Guam Legislature. KUAM TV. It's been great. I hope you enjoyed your poll too this morning. My name's Chris. I'm Sabrina. Hasta adios. No, the, the speaker was talking about um, uh, phone calls and, you know, people not answering. Oh, just, yeah, <laughs> that, that government employees, uh, you know, we're, we're asking them to, this is the time to do, you know, above and beyond. We have to all do that because we are making up for lost time. We have businesses and families depending on us to do what we're supposed to do. And, uh, and especially if it hasn't been done for the last few months, right? Those are the worst scenarios. So, you know, you're seeing oversight hearings uh, 
going on right now. We just had one recently on Guam Land Use Commission because of several complaints about them taking too long to address uh, pending applications for uh, different projects. Um, you know, and and come to find out, yeah. So we're addressing those issues. You're going to see another slew of bills uh, that address some of those issues there. But um, but really, it's these agencies, uh, and a lot of them, again, they tell you, you know, they're strapped for employees, they're strapped for time, they're, they're strapped with all the mandates that they've been given. And uh, I appreciate that 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 is true. But yeah, still, we just have to we just have to do it anyways, and and until we can fix those issues. And so, just like we're trying to help the private businesses recover during this time, I think government has to go above and beyond because uh, we can. And and if we don't, they won't. You know, they won't be able to recover. Uh, families will not be able to recover. And that's my biggest worry right now is this could be much worse and you know it's sometimes i know you're thinking chris can't get worse than this but it could be much worse and we need to make sure it does not get worse i'm think i'm talking about the effect that this has had on families mm -hmm. and i think we we're seeing that and we've seen it all along but but i don't even think we've seen anywhere near the end of that yet that we have uh, got to step up our services and they've got to everyone's got to be full on board on that right. getting right. food getting shelter getting uh schooling, getting, you know, just uh, supervision, getting uh, all of their needs met uh, that that they've not been able to meet, you know, health care, health, especially health care. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of nervous of what, especially if this PUA situation isn't resolved with the, the employees that yes. are work, uh, on reduced work hours not being eligible right now. I, right. I just can't. Exactly. <laughs> it's a whole other set of people that, yeah, we're, we need to take care of on another end right like um the you know expanded medicaid expanded uh, mm -hmm. everything yeah we, we i think it's very very alarming and very serious so i'm um, i think we have to work we have to really work double time on this yeah right on you good anything yeah. else no uh, was there anything else speaker yeah speaker well i i just wanted to say uh um you know we have a very serious uh and in, in addition to the 62, 64 million dollars in cuts that we made in the last budget, we're facing a deficit in revenues from the first quarter. And no one has said that they think that we can make that up in the next quarter. So I'm, I'm very interested to hear your guests this morning and whether they think that that can be made up. Because if it can't, we have to take some serious action. And I'm very concerned because what I'm talking about impacts to families when you cut the government services more we might be cutting in you know uh our services to families and i just think we have to everybody's got to put everything on the table and we've got to make sure that that does not happen yeah. that when we make cuts to the government that we cut we cut the things that are not necessary today yep. they might be great projects but they're not necessary today but we do not cut the government services that we need to cut and so that's I think we can do it. We just have to really focus on it, and we have to do it swiftly before before we're drowning in it. Yeah. yeah. And I I am afraid we have to expand government services to these families. I'm I'm like Sabrina said. You know we we have to take care of ourselves. We can't uh, count on anyone else to take care of Guam at this point. I think we should take care of these families, and that should be our first priority. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, and I just hope we can get past the. Um, some of the games we saw last year where, you know, public health uh, was saying, oh, the first thing we're going to cut, if our budget get cut, we're going to cut the Monomco services, you know. So hopefully we can do all this. Yeah. I'm glad you pointed that out, Chris, because, yes, and, and you know, they're going to talk about cutting foster children, right, and all of that. That's what I'm talking about. It's yeah. kind of like everybody needs to step up and stop that, those games. That Those games are not going to get us anywhere that, you know, you should have, you should prioritize the children's services, prioritize everything else. Show us how smart you are and cut the other things, right? And uh, I think every agency can do this. And, um, uh, yeah, I bet, but, okay, I thought alternate behavior was going to be the takeaway, but I want to, this Gov Guam, show us how smart you are. Can you, can you give us like the, yeah. show us how smart you are. I mean, because you're right, I speaker. I mean, it's like, they they <laughs> first programs on the chopping block are the ones that really benefit our working people they want to delay the minimum wage i'm just like let's not get too far ahead of you know yes 
Well, I'm, I'm that's taking it out on the hearing, little bit. You know, yeah. saying the minimum wage has impacts to these people. We, we passed a minimum wage increase because they needed it, right? And these families need it to take care of their families. And um, that's, if they don't take care of it in wages, we are going to take care of it in the government. And so that's what I'm saying. You know, we better be prepared for this because as Sabrina said, this is happening. These are families are in need. These children have been out of school too long, right? We are going to see needs that uh, you're, we're going to have to all put our efforts into and uh, no more delays, yes. Thank but, you. But uh, I wanna say that I have seen, yeah, bills come in. There are about 42 bills now. The Many hearings are set for next week since the referrals have been made now. And uh, the week after that, we, we, we will be going into session on February 12th. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to addressing some of these things right away. All right. Thanks Thank you. a lot. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker. Thank you. So we'll see you next, next Wednesday. Okay. Gotcha. Set your right. calendar. Thanks. Appreciate your time this morning. All right. Take Esther. care. There you go. Yeah, those uh -huh. uh, show us how smart you are. Wow. I like that. That's, yeah. I can run with that. Let's get some t-shirts made. It's the new COVID is a bitch. Show <laughs> us how smart you are. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm looking at, she's right. There is a whole slew of bills that are up for a public hearing. Right. Uh, there's like one. One, two, three, four, five, eight. There's like seven, eight hearings next week. Yeah, there's a lot of bills that aren't up for a public hearing either. Oh, well, there's an oversight.